Hello, everyone, and welcome to um, the uh, December Transformative Salon. Um, as Claudia mentioned, my name is Irena Remestvensky. I'm very happy to welcome you today to uh, a little bit of an experimental format for our salon. Um, usually, as you know, uh, if you visited the transformative salon before, we have uh, one or two main speakers who basically fill the evening um, with their lecture or lectures. Um, but today we decided to do a kind of a two-step or two-stage um, two-stage event um, and combine uh, some academic insights um, from the work of our two speakers um, with some uh, life experiences from the people um, that know, unfortunately, from first-hand experience about what it is like to be an academic in exile. Um, so uh, our two main speakers today are Florian Postal and Vera Aksionova. Uh, and they are the authors um, of the book called Academics in Exile, Networks, Knowledge Exchange, and New Forms of Internationalization. Um, the book is very, very new. Um, it uh, appeared in the publishing house transcript uh, only on the 28th of June this year. Um, and the book um, is um, about the situations, situations of the scholars um, um, who had to leave their homeland um, and go to another country um, in a non-voluntary way, let's say. And that the book deals with, um, so the authors will, will tell you more about the book, but the book is um, about the different uh, professional trajectories um, of these scholars and about various aspects of uh, the, the host societies that are hosting them. The book is very importantly um, open access. That means that is completely available online and can be downloaded and read in full um, for free. Um, and um, there are three editors, three authors of this book, um, two of which we have on the podium today. Uh, and I'm really happy to introduce uh, to you first um, Florian Kostal, uh, Dr. Florian Kostal from the um, Freie Universität Berlin. Um, Florian is the director of um, a program called Global Responsibility at the Freie Universität. Um, he has a firsthand migration, not a migration background, but a migration experience. As uh, you just told me, Florian, that you spent almost 10 years in Cairo in Egypt, uh, building up a liaison office of the Freie Universität in Cairo. Um, and you also founded uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentoring program for academics in exile called Academics in Solidarity at the Freie Universität. Uh, you have taught political science in different places in Azan Provence, uh, in Lyon, um, and in Cairo. And Florian is also interested uh, in his research in um, university reform, in knowledge production, um, and in discourses about academic freedom. Um, and um, our second speaker, so co author of Florian, is Vera Aksonova. Um, Viera Aksionova is currently uh, a Marie Curie and Rewire Fellow uh, at the University of Vienna at the uh, Political Communication Research Group. Um, she, before coming to the University of Vienna, she gathered experience uh, in, in basically many different fields. Um, she worked at the University of Gießen as assistant professor. Um, she was um, managing director of Academics and Solidarity, so the same uh, mentoring program uh, which Florian co-founded, um, and uh, also has some experience in policy consulting uh, and other fields. Uh, and, and Vera holds a PhD from uh, the University of Bremen, and if I may mention that, uh, comes originally from Kazakhstan, so also has a first-hand uh, idea of what it is to be a migrant in a different country. Uh, well, not a forced migrant, but still a migrant, if I may say so. Um, we will have uh, two more colleagues joining us for the second part of this podium, but I'm going to reserve uh, their introduction for later, so you don't forget uh, who is speaking. Um, and we, we wanted to, so it's, it's kind of a book presentation, but we wanted to hold it in a very interactive format. And so I'm happy just to open the podium and, and give the word to Florian and Vera. Uh, and my first question to both of you, and you can decide who of you speaks first and in which, uh, uh, which 
uh, who goes first and who goes second. And I was, I'm just really wondering about um, the book you're planning to present and, and um, just a, you know, a very open question. What is this book about really? I mean, we understand it's about academics in exile, but how did you come up with the idea to, uh, to edit this book? And uh, also maybe because the events have been changing so fast, when did you come up with this idea? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Irina, um, and thank you very much, Vera, also, um, for um, letting me start uh, this discussion, actually, and uh, tell you how this book came about and uh, what are the main aspects, conclusions, um, yeah, maybe also lessons um, from what we did in editing this volume. Uh, I would. Uh, like to express first my happiness that I have the occasion to uh, present uh, this book together here uh, with Vera uh, in Vienna uh, in a place called Florianihof. Uh, as my name is Florian, of course, I'm very touched by this, you can uh, imagine. And I would like to thank the Research Center for the History of Transformations and in particular Irina Remestvensky and Claudia Kraft also for, for organizing this event, this uh, transformative salon, which I think is a very good title um, to uh, present this book, because I think the subject we are treating is something um, that is transformative uh, in, in two ways. It's on the one hand, it shows us that, or it illustrates very much the, the academics uh, in exile uh, theme that we are currently in a permanent crisis. One crisis is following the other, and this is basically restrictions to academic freedom uh, are threatening many scholars in many different countries uh, in the past years. And uh, Vera and myself, we have been working on this uh, Academics in Solidarity project, which is a project that it's based uh, at Freie Universität Berlin, uh, which tries actually to uh, provide uh, long-term career paths um, for uh, exiled scholars. So the book, if you want, is very much something that comes out of our own experience with academics in exile, with different academics in exile. When we started the project in 2016, um, it concerned mainly Syrian scholars. Um, then in, from 2018 onwards, it concerned uh, mainly Turkish scholars. Uh, and uh, then we had scholars from Belarus, but also from Afghanistan. And now this year, um, there is also a lot of uh, scholars uh, from Ukraine um, coming to Germany, um, supported by different formats. Um, short-term, long-term scholarship. I'm going to talk about this a little bit in detail, um, but the thing is really that I think we talk a new about a new category of scholars, displaced scholars, academics in exile, however you would call it, which also are transforming academia, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's a product of worldwide transformations, but at the same time, and this is something the book really tries to highlight as well, um, receiving scholars uh, in exile in Germany, in Austria and elsewhere has an effect on the academic system um, as well. And this is one of the, 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 the points uh, I would uh, like um, to highlight. Um, interestingly enough, if you talk about ourselves, we would both consider us as expat scholars, at least for a certain time. Uh, Vera as a scientist who has lived for a long time in Germany and now in Austria. Uh, and myself, I was doing research for quite a long time in Egypt. And uh, initially, actually, we uh, wanted to put uh, together a panel uh, at a congress uh, and contrast the experience of exiled scholars and expat scholars, right? And this was somehow how also the book was born because then the editor approached us if we do not want to write a book about that. But then we realized really that contrasting exiled and expat scholars would be uh, rather daring because the conditions of voluntary mobility and forced mobility are completely different and can not really be compared. And this is why fortunately also this book concentrates then about academics and exile. And it reunites, um, yeah, contributions from different scholars. 
uh, scholars who are in touch with academics in exile and who reflect also on their own work, um, but also from exiled scholars who reflect about their path uh, into a new academic environment, um, but also then about different support programs and which I think fortunately um, reflect very critically uh, about this past and about this um, different uh, support programs. Would you like to jump in here already? Because I think I gave a short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you also on, on my end for, for organizing this uh, event. It's, it's really an honor and pleasure to, to speak here. And um, well, here is the book, Florian also uh, showed it. This is um, sort of the result of, of what came out of our efforts in the end. And I must mention, we have also a third co-editor who is not present today, Carola Richter, who is a professor of communication studies in, at the Freie Universität Berlin, and one of the mentors at the uh, Academics and Solidarity Program. And um, I think the composition of the authorship, um, do you hear me well? I hope so. Okay. Um, the composition of the authorship and not only of the uh, um, editorial members sort of shows what the main idea behind the book was. And the main idea was um, that we think about life in exile and experiences of scholars who live in exile um, with them together in a very reflexive and participatory way. Uh, so at least half of the chapters uh, in this book has been written by scholars uh, living in exile themselves or who had previously had experiences of, ox uh, of exile, either themselves or in their families, or by those who are involved with support programs for at risk and endangered or displaced scholars. Uh, those who are either involved into the leadership or management of such programs, uh, such as myself, or in, in, in the case of Florian, this is also the case, or our mentors are acting as mentors. Um, so just, just to introduce you very briefly, um, maybe the structure won't be certainly going chapter by, by chapter, but the, the book has four, um, sort of following the introduction that has been written by us three, uh, the book has four main uh, parts in it, and we start sort of with more historical approaches, historical glances at what exiled meant before, um, contrasting it later to what it has become known now. Uh, so looking through these historical lenses into the experiences of exiled uh, Jewish German scholars, for instance, in uh, Turkey, who went to Turkey and uh, left Germany uh, during the Third Reich, um, or who went also to teach uh, in the southern states in the US. Um, another chapter contrasting also experiences of um, Indonesian um, uh, early stage scholars, let's, let's call them this. Uh, so exiles who were at their master's PhD level uh, going abroad to study and sort of stranded uh, during their studies abroad because of the coup d'etat that happened back in their country. So in, in this part uh, of the book, uh, the authors um, were trying, um, working with very anthropological methodologists to look into what the experiences of this course were back then. Uh, and trying to sort of de-romanticize in a way also the picture of exile and immigre life that we commonly have in our heads when we think about prominent names of exile scholars, such as Hannah Arendt, for instance. Um, in the next um, part of the book, we sort of go and arrive in, in the current period of time. So what, what we are experiencing. And the book was written, I must say, um, the, the initial idea came up before even 2020 and was written throughout 2020. So um, the chapters are of course not concerning the current experiences of for instance, scholars from Ukraine um, and not even scholars who started living uh, Belarus in 2020 uh, following the suppression of the demonstrations there. So uh, the, 
the experiences when I'm talking about current experiences in the book, I refer to the experiences primarily of uh, scholars from Syria and scholars from Turkey with a big focus on uh, Germany, but not only. So uh, many of the scholars who have written, uh, uh, who are authors in the book, they are based themselves in Germany. And that is why also the strong focus on, on Germany as a host country. And this, um, chap this part of the book strongly focuses on uh, what the life in exile actually is, how they experience um, the loss of networks, for instance, in their home country, how they experience the new uh, academic environment, how they um, can become part of, of this new environment and what difficulties and challenges, but also opportunities they encounter on the way. Um, so this is sort of the part of the book that contrasts uh, the perspectives of the scholars living in exile uh, with uh, support program views, basically. So what support programs are there and how they can um, aid scholars who are living in exile, what is possible and what is not. Um, in the third uh, part, uh, the authors are focusing more on what is um, sort of what the third spaces um, emerge based on the experiences of scholars living in exile. So this is where um, the authors try to delve more into the question of um, how the knowledge that is being brought can be used, how it um, can influence the systems where the host systems where the scholars live currently, uh, what initiatives um, emerge from their own efforts. Uh, and in the final part, um, the uh, uh, authors focus more on the um, perspectives, what we call South-South perspectives, because in many cases, scholars who leave their countries, um, they do not go too far. So in many cases, they actually stay in their neighboring countries. And since um, the majority of scholars leaving their country, or in many cases, at least, they are coming from the global South, they actually stay in the global south. They do not come to the global north. And the conditions, the host conditions in the neighboring countries um, vary quite a bit, but they also differ a lot, uh, big time, from what is being experienced in Europe, for instance. And uh, so it was very important for us that we have a part in the book where those experiences are also reflected and also find their way in, in, into this discussion. Anything you would, would like to add, or Irina? <laughs> Well, I'd be thank you for the for this uh, for this uh, beginning. Um, I would be happy to hear more about, um, for example, the, um, the the support programs that exist there, and what have you found maybe through working on this book um, about what kind of different logics exist behind the support programs that are being created. Um, I mean, we probably are especially interested in, in, in Europe or the global north, but also in the global south. Um, how, how do these support programs uh, come to be and, and what kind of you know, logic uh, is used to decide uh, how to help best to those scholars leaving their countries? Yeah, okay. I'm going to focus a little bit on the, the support programs, uh, which I know it's mainly uh, German uh, support programs. Um, <clears throat> first of all, one of the things that was surprising me when we uh, started this uh, volume was uh, that uh, historically we are not um, discussing something completely new. There was, for example, the Notgemeinschaft, which uh, Vera mentioned this already, um, send it uh, Jewish German scholars to Turkey um, who had to uh, flee from the Nazi regime uh, during that time. Um, so already at that time there were different uh, support programs um, and there is one article in the book uh, who talks about uh, the moral economy of these uh, support programs. Uh, not only at the time, um, but also um, today. Um, today, one of the most prominent um, support program that exists in Germany is the Philipp Schwartz Initiative um, of the Alexander von Humboldt um, Foundation, and which is a special format of the Alexander von Humboldt um, Foundation because it uh, concentrates on at-risk scholars. So um, scholars who would like to apply for this program, 
um, they have to apply through a German uh, host university. It's the university that applies for them. And they have to prove first that they are at risk. So this goes through a vetting process, which is either done by uh, Scholars at Risk or CARA, which are the two most prominent, one based in the United States and the other one in England, which are the most prominent um, organizations doing um, this vetting process. Um, I think Philip Schwartz has supported since 2016 more than 300 uh, scholars, uh, mainly from Turkey, from Syria, from Yemen. Um, they had a special Afghanistan program and they also had a special um, Ukraine um, program. What I observed a little bit through how the selection goes, there is this uh, constant um, sort of discussion about the tension between humanitarian aid and scientific excellency, right? And uh, this is really a problem because the legitimacy of such a special program that is only dedicated for at-risk scholars is of course humanitarian aid. Otherwise, you would need to channel them through the standard programs. So the at-risk status is something necessary. But uh, as more and more uh, scholars have received that stipend, the commission also looks more and more into the question of excellency and employability. Yeah, Because they say, of course, um, well, it's a noble <laughs> aim to follow the at-risk status. But at the same time, what are we going to do if we support scholars that afterwards, because first of all, of course, they thought maybe we're going to support them two years and then they might return back. And this oftentimes is not the case yeah? because the crisis in the home country lasts much longer than we expect. If we talk about Syria, Yemen, all these cases now, Ukraine also, um, we expected probably a war of, well, I'm, I, I'm not going to, too much into this detail. Um, but they say, okay, after these two years, they also have to find a job in Germany, all right? And if we support someone with a program at the university to pursue a scientific career, um, then we also have to acknowledge that, for example, in Germany, we have one of the most competitive uh, um, university system where it is very hard to get a long-term um, job, right? So, um, yeah. Basically, and this is where this excellency criteria comes in. And excellency is, of course, the main legitimacy of the university work itself, but it is somehow in constant contradiction. And I think uh, here uh, it is interesting that uh, it is mainly contributors who are themselves, uh, who were themselves uh, scholarship holders from the Philip Schwartz Initiative who uh, showed relatively well the limits of this temporary aid. Um, the author, for example, Asli Wattensever, she used this, uh, this term of that they serve as a quarantine for exiled researchers because they do not really allow them to integrate the German academic system on a long-term scale, but only for this short time purpose. And then basically they have to see um, that they either go somewhere else. And as you all know, for exiled researchers, for someone who is applying for asylum, mobility is not something that is given per se, that is very hard uh, sort of to achieve. So I think this is one of the, I don't know the word in English for Sackgasse. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is somehow uh, not for all, but for some of these scholarship holders, uh, certain dead end and illustrates, uh, on the other hand, this double precarity. Precarity of doing research in your home country because you cannot do it anymore because of reasons of war, restrictions on academic freedom, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But precarity also when you are uh, a displaced scholar in Germany um, because you rely on this uh, short uh, short-term uh, or relatively short-term support schemes. 
it doesn't it uh, show though how how precarity is, is simply part of um, you know of the life of all scholars in in Europe and doesn't it in your I don't know how what's your your take on that and doesn't it just show basically the flaws of the system even more when you have to integrate um, a scholar from outside who is maybe maybe excellent in science but maybe is not for example a perfect cultural fit for for the system absolutely um absolutely i mean um if we take a system as as it is now the academic system in in german speaking countries and there was uh recently on, at least not so long ago if i remember correctly the statistics of the university of vienna i think those who are part of the so-called mittelbau there are only 80 um only less than 20 percent who have unlimited contracts so those who are working at the university of vienna at doctoral postdoctoral level um they have uh, contracts that last two to three years, maybe, uh, sometimes four, sometimes longer, but also with the new law that we observed that, that came into force, uh, the legal change uh, last year, um, which only adds to, to the precari precarization, further precarization of the system in the end. If we take German statistics, it's even scarier than the Austrian one, because um, if you consider that currently only 4% of those who graduate from PhD programs, who get a PhD, become full professors, 4%, 96% of people with PhD go elsewhere. They leave the uh, academic research system. Um, so how sustainable is the system as such if you lose more than 90% of people you educate and train up to a certain level? Um, and now we have a group of people who are coming from outside this system. Uh, they were baked and cooked in a very different academic environment with very different, in a way, different requirements. Um, and partly also different measurements and criteria of what is considered to be excellent in academia. Uh, if we take uh, European or global north, let's, let's put it in a more general sense, uh, what counts as being a successful scientist, then you can run down basically two things, uh, down, down to two criteria. First of all, that you publish in peer reviewed journals in, with good impact factor, um, this is one. Uh, in most of the cases, those are English-speaking uh, journals that uh, whose editorial board members sit in Global North universities. Uh, and the other uh, main criterion is the um, ability to acquire third-party funding. Now, uh, third-party funding works very differently in different countries, and in certain academic environments, this is not a requirement as such because funding of the universities works differently by the state. Meaning that if you are coming from a different academic environment, you might have published, first of all, considering the first criterion, uh, in other journals that might not have had an uh, impact factor that is now required of you. Uh, you might have published not in English. Uh, so you're already not complying with this criterion and you are in competition with people who are publishing in those journals. And the second criterion, if you're coming from a country like Syria, where uh, third party funding doesn't work the way it works in Germany at all, then you both, you basically cannot prove that you had third party funding experience, neither acquisition of this funding, nor the management of the project as such, based on third party funding. So you're basically losing on both criteria uh, that are most important that have been defined though in the global north by the universities in the host systems where the scholars are now arriving to and need to become part of if they um, do not see for themselves the way to return back to their home countries. And that becomes of course a problem because you are coming from a volatile uh, background uh, where you cannot return anymore. Uh, the yes path, uh, and the longer you stay in the, in the host country, the statistics which, uh, would show us, the more you are likely to stay in that country in the end and not return. Um, and yet you are arriving in a very precarious situation with a system where, as you, uh, Irina, uh, were saying, which is definitely not flawless, and it has a lot of flaws, 
and in its very, very structure. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, Vera, and maybe uh, you know less of a question and more of a small comment um, from you know what I see as uh, from my volunteer work as a coordinator of science for Ukraine. I find it really interesting this whole discussion on academic excellency because from the statistics that we have collected, for example, from Ukrainian scholars in exile in Austria uh, and across Europe, it really seems like. Uh, to, you know, to be a successful refugee scholar, you have to be academically excellent, but not too excellent, because if you were a professor back home, uh, as I hope we will hear more, because we have, um, we have colleagues now um, from Ukraine at Reset who were professors already back home, but if you were a professor back home, you basically see your chances, uh, you know, uh, close very fast in front of you, because again, um, as you mentioned, Vera, this, the system has, uh, you know, it looks like a, um, uh, like, uh, I'm trying to f come up with the mathematical shape and I cannot, but you know what I mean? It basically, a lot of people are starting at the bottom and it goes uh, very not narrow at the top. And even for, uh, for a person from a completely uh, non-migrational background, it is very difficult to go all the way to the top. Uh, and if you're already somehow at the top of the chain in another country, that somehow means nothing in another country where you arrived. So that's quite interesting. And it um, um, basically, we, we did a survey in Science for Ukraine, and we saw that, that the most um, successful uh, scholars from Ukraine who got the most opportunities out of these refugee scholarships were the, the middle part, you know, the postdocs mainly, because as a PhD student, you have um, not enough to show to prove your academic excellency. And as a professor from Ukraine, you have a lot to show, but it's like it's not a fit for the new system. Um, so that I find quite quite interesting in this whole discussion about excellency uh, versus humanitarian reasons. Um, so with that base, I'm, I'm wondering actually um, after publishing your book, how do you feel? How did the situation change? For example, especially with the arrival of so many Ukrainian scholars. Um, since the beginning of this full-scale invasion um, of the Russian Federation in Ukraine. And do you feel that uh, some lessons were learned from previous con conflicts or uh, is, it all, is it all the same? <laughs> and you know the situation better <laughs> at the moment. Uh, we are we are we are just assessing it because it's really a very it's it's still relatively fresh. Um, in general, I would say there are two moments of learning uh, when it comes to the university as a whole and the question of migration. For Germany, 2015 was a first learning moment. Uh, before 2015, students who came to Germany were not allowed to study when they were refugees. And it was in 2015 that this rule was skipped and they, <coughs> they were sort of allowed to study. And a lot of programs, support programs were also set up, um, German learning, um, but also preparatory courses, etc., to integrate them in you, into the university. So this was a learning moment for how we are dealing with refugee students. Um, I think for refugee and refugee scientists, displaced scholars, the learning curve was certainly with the war in Ukraine. Yeah? Um, because uh, at, at that time, it was not necessarily, first of all, on the national level that new support programs were put in place, but it was rather on the university level. So, for example, Freie Universität Berlin, they just gave money to the departments so that the departments could set up an emergency scholarship scheme for three months. And it was... I followed the discussion at Freie Universität Berlin. It was at that time that a professor told us, but uh, why don't we give also remote stipends? There are uh, scientists within Ukraine who had to leave their university, who are now hosted by another uh, Ukrainian university, but they also need our support. Um, and so um, because we did it through the departments, it was complicated because you have to transfer money uh, to a foreign country. It was very complicated. Um, but while we did it through the departments and we put very little rules on this remote for, uh, scholarship, the only condition was that there has to be a link between the professor at Freie Universität Berlin at, and the professor or the scholar, the postdoc, 
uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so we also uh, managed to, to put in place this uh, remote uh, scholarship scheme. But that's something that was set up for 2022. And now the question is how we're gonna continue, right? So I would say, yeah, there is some, some learning, but at the same time, the question is if you are able sort of to generalize this learning, yeah? Uh, if you can, if you're really able to put in place a long-term scholarship, uh, scholarship scheme, and then if you can also apply it to a group of people who shares the same condition, yeah? Because on the long run, of course, it cannot be a scholarship that is only dedicated for scholars in Ukraine, uh, but it has to be somehow applied to uh, the whole group of uh, at-risk and uh, refugee scientists. And this question is not solved at all. So the learning process was there, but the problem about, um, in general, I think what we witnessed very much with the Academics and Solidarity Program, you always have three, four, five months of enthusiasm. We want to help. <laughs> and then this enthusiasm unfortunately fades, right? Because the next crisis is coming. So the attention now is, we are looking now towards Iran, for example, uh, and uh, not that much anymore about Ukraine. So this is something that really, or where sustainability uh, very much suffers from this kind of, I mean, it's, of course, you all know how these crises are triggered and how they are promoted. It's, I mean, but we have to have this awareness that crises are lasting and that we need durable solutions. That's what I would like to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and Florian and maybe also Vera, I'm not sure who of you would, would be best to answer this question, but I'm wondering also about the gender aspect. Um, so I don't know that much about previous conflicts and I can only see basically what's, what's happening in, um, in this Ukrainian uh, case where um, where you have a large group of scholars who are exiled, who, who are experiencing forced migration, but also another large group of scholars, which we don't talk so much about, and who is experiencing kind of a forced, um, forced condition of staying in their country. And that's the, the male scholars, who uh, uh, many of whom probably would have left or would leave the country now if they had the chance but they must stay due to the, the current Ukrainian laws. Um, and who um, certainly are often under the same risks or maybe other, but, but equal risks um, as the women um, from Ukraine. Um, can, you make, can you compare this case uh, maybe a little bit with, with previous conflicts, which you, which you described in your book? Um, were there any interesting gender aspects in those other conflicts that you can, um, that you can talk about? I mean, I can compare it based on, on, I guess, my experience as uh, when I was managing academics and solidarity. What was clearly uh, notable, I think, in, in the gender composition of the groups that were members of the program back then was the uh, distinction between Syrian scholars and uh, Turkish scholars, both uh, based on gender, but also uh, disciplinary backgrounds. And this is also quite interesting because in the case of Syrian scholars, we had a huge dominance of male scholars in natural hard sciences. Um, whereas in the case of Turkish scholars, in, in many cases, we had women uh, specializing in social and uh, sciences and humanities. Um, so there was this distinction that you could see between the two largest groups of scholars. What is very different um, to the current case um, of Ukrainian scholars, first of all, the, uh, uh, what you mentioned yourself that uh, mainly the scholars who are coming here are the, the, the vast majority, almost everyone are women, of course, because they are allowed to leave the country. Um, I cannot say anything about the composition in terms of disciplinary background. You probably know this better as, as the coordinator of science for Ukraine. <laughs> Um, for us in Austria, but um, what was different back then is certainly that um, those who, who sort of left the country, um, they could not go back. What we observe now is partly the circular migration of scholars who are staying here, but trying to return or going for some time and then returning back here. 
this is a very new phenomenon, I think, in general for, for forced migration. But we also, of course, observe this in the scholar group of migrants. Um, and this is very, very different from what we observed in the case of Syria or Turkey, because there was basically, if you left the country, you left the country. Um, and in many cases, uh, for Syrians, of course, it meant that they cannot return still and will not be able to return for the foreseeable future, especially um, after actually applying for asylum, because we need to, this is also why we do not use the term refugee in our book, basically nowhere. Uh, or we tried very strongly to avoid that. Uh, we are talking about what's called a displacement rather than a refugee, which is a legal term in a way. Um, because in many cases, scholars who love their countries, they actually did not apply for refugee status. They came on other visa. And once their visa or their passports expired, they were in a way forced into applying for asylum, um, which in many cases was not an easy choice because it meant that for Syrians, for instance, that they would not be able to return. In many cases, they would fast, uh, face an arrest in airport once returning with an asylum status in their passport. Um, for Turkish uh, citizens, it meant in many cases also a very difficult decision that they were also in, in a high situation of uncertainty. They didn't know some of them hey, had um, court cases running against them. Uh, applying for asylum was for those who had the, uh, the, the um, uh, processes against them started in Turkey, back in Turkey. That meant an easier case for an asylum, but simultaneously it also meant they probably would never be able to go back as well. So that, um, that it was um, a somewhat different situation when, when you're discussing the high situation of uncertainty for Ukrainian scholars right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if that's the difference between uh, scholars who flee a war uh, versus scholars who flee political persecution, which is not so much the case for Ukrainians in the current conflict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a way, I'm, I mean, in the case of Syria, this is kind of both. This is, uh, I mean, everyone who fled Syria back then were fleeing war in the first place, um, or. If, it was basically a combination of both the political violence in, in the form of war, but also potential uh, potential persecution, potential uh, being kidnapped by non-government forces and so on. So it was a mixture basically of factors that were driving people out of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, very interesting. Uh, somewhat another topic. Um, you have... Uh, knowledge transfer even in the in the title of your book and I am wondering um, what what kind of uh, lessons have we learned or what kind of takeaways do we have about knowledge transfer um, in the situation of scholars in exile and what what kind of dynamics do we see or what kind of results do we see uh, um, on the on the level of exchange of knowledge for example between the the host institutions and the, the home institutions of the um, of scholars um, in exile um, is there much happening there at all, or is it mostly uh, scholars leaving their home institutions and kind of losing the ties to back home? Huh. Okay, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, because I think that, uh, to be honest, we only partly um, answered this question in the book. <laughs> uh, it was one of the main objectives also, because I mean, when we go a little bit back to the beginning, uh, Vera mentioned this, uh, you have this, uh, um, somehow this picture of exiled scholars as um, really somehow the heroes and stars of the discipline, thinking about Walter Benjamin, Hannah Arendt, Edward Said, um, and some of them, who? Einstein. Einstein, yeah. And some of them, I think they noted even that exile was the most productive time somehow, sometimes because it was going uh, parallelly with so much suffering, right? I mean, this is this paradox, yeah? It becomes scholarly when the conditions allow it, a very productive time. 
So we wanted to show this also for our group that we are working with. But of course, time is somehow a little bit short here, right? I mean, this um, it takes time for someone to become famous. Um, nevertheless, I think that there are um, some observations that we can make about um, knowledge transfer. Um, first of all, I think when it comes, for example, now about the Turkish colors, I would say that they very much uh, contribute to the reactivation of modern Turkish studies in Germany. Uh, something that is has been, I think, rather neglected. And through the subjects they are treating in their research, um, oftentimes very sensitive subjects, of course, this is also why they had to flee, because they are working on minorities about, for example, Kurdish minorities, about other subjects that had become taboo subjects in Turkey. They very much contribute also to, I think, a reactivation of these um, studies um, within Germany. This would be my first hypothesis, but for proving it, we have a critical thinking program of the Academy in Exile uh, at Freie Universität Berlin that regroups, that makes a cohort. Uh, initially, it was about Turkish scholars, but then they widened the scope and they also integrated scholars from other countries um, that rather tries to form a group about, yeah, a certain, yeah, discipline, which are critical studies. Yeah? Um, so I think there we can observe some um, knowledge transfer. The other thing, interesting thing is this reflection about uh, academic freedom and the state of higher education in the home country and in the host country, if you want, or in the country where they are now, because this is such a pressing subject and oftentimes it is sort of triggered by the fact that these programs are also framed uh, in terms like academic freedom. So suddenly the scholars start to write about this and start to write very critically about this. And this is, I think, also a very uh, fruitful um, debate. Um, for example, the debate about academic freedom in Germany was 10 years ago, basically absent from higher education studies. So second observation, but of course, only a partial observation. We observe also important knowledge transfer in all the disciplines where people still or have done field work in their home country or neighboring countries in subjects like archaeology, Egyptology, etc., and who bring this knowledge uh, now to Germany. Unfortunately, of course, they cannot go back to the field. And so also the way of studying is sort of um, inter interrupted. But last but not least, I also have to say that especially with the Academics and Solidarity program, we, when we started the program, the, the idea was also to work with neighboring host countries like Jordan and Lebanon, where most of the scientists uh, from Syria went uh, in the beginning. And we quickly saw that it was very difficult uh, to establish a similar program there because the restriction in the academic labor market are such that foreigners are usually not allowed um, to work there, especially if they are categorized as um, refugees. And from this point of view, this kind of transnational mission that we pursued in the beginning, because we thought it's important. Um, I mean, there are people who argue also that there's a lot of brain drain happening now through these uh, programs. And this is finally going to be a problem after all. Um, so this transnational mission, we couldn't really fulfill it, I, I think, from the, from the point of the program. Yeah. So some elements, but uh, probably not all. And for, for, for Ukrainian scholars, I would love to hear more from <laughs> the colleagues, uh, because I think that they can tell us more about it. Yes, and, and so I think it's a, it's a uh, you know, mentioning brain drain, <laughs> it's a sad part, but also a good moment to, to maybe move to the, the second part of our event, where we thought to, uh, you know, experiment with the format a bit uh, and mix up the podium a little bit with some current experiences. And so I'm really happy to invite uh, two of our colleagues uh, to join me on this quite cozy podium. We'll find space for you. Uh, and I am happy to introduce, first of all, uh, Halina Ilina. Um, 
and also Alina Nitschik. Um, Galina Ilina, right to my left side, um, is uh, currently a Ukraine fellow at the Research Center for the History of Transformations. Um, and she is, and uh, really she is still a professor at the Tarashevchenko National University in Kiev. Um, Galina obtained her PhD, both her PhD and her habilitation degree in philosophy, uh, the last one in 2019. Um, and she, I think you spent all of your professional life in science. So you worked as a senior researcher at the National Scientific Institute of Ukrainian Studies and World History of the Ministry of Science and Education of Ukraine. Um, and you're teaching at the Taras uh, Shevchenko National University in Kiev already since 2012. Um, and um, so Galina was unfortunately displaced by, by the war, uh, well, by the most recent uh, occasion of the war, let's say, by, by um, the invasion of the Russian Federation. Um, actually, I don't know when you left Ukraine, probably in March uh, or around the time. Um, and um, Galina was first uh, a fellow, so a, a, a refugee fellow at the University of Graz um, before she joined Reset um, two months ago. So um, Galina, I'm really happy to welcome you on the podium. And our second colleague joining us um, from the Ukraine program uh, at Reset is uh, Dr. Alina Nitschik. Um, Alina is um, uh, or she studied international economics um, in Kiev and Wroclaw, um, and she did her PhD um, at the University of Manchester in the UK. So Alina has been abroad for quite a long time now. So I think you spent most of your 10 years, some your master's studies and your PhD time um, abroad. And you finished your PhD uh, basically when the when the invasion started, so just around the time. And I think you even defended already while the war was going on. Um, so quite a different, but also, a, a, you know, a very interesting situation. Um, Alina is um, currently fellow at Reset, uh, also an honorary fellow at the University of Manchester, where she did her PhD, um, but she's also a social activist. So she's working in a variety of project uh, projects focusing, for example, on women's empowerment, uh, democracy, EU-Ukraine integration, and she is a um, board member um, at the Professional Government of Ukraine, which is an NGO um, that um, unites um, Ukrainian alumni of uh, many of the world's leading universities who decided to go back to Ukraine, all of this, of course, before the invasion, decided to go back to Ukraine and try to build uh, the best government in the world in Ukraine. Uh, official mission. So, Alina Galina, I'm super happy to, very happy to, to welcome you on this podium. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Galina, um, because I find it really interesting that you are, you know, still working in Ukraine, and we really see that at the research office because Galina is always there, basically, and she is teaching her students in Kiev from our office most of days, and so. I would really love you uh, to tell me a little bit from your point of view about the situation of Ukrainian universities and how they are coping with those different challenges and risks that, that they were confronted with since the beginning of the invasion. So how are the Ukrainian universities doing? Thank you, Irena, for your question. Well, actually, despite of physical destruction of the building, despite of significant migration of students and university staff, despite of regular missile strike and actually everyday um, air raid sirens, universities in Ukraine works and uh, my colleagues uh, in Ukraine, they are doing a great job in order to preserve academic culture and academic life during the war. Uh, I would like to tell that there are a lot of challenges, maybe for main uh, obvious uh, safety, communication, um, migration, and actually challenges about how to preserve higher education in a turbulent time. Uh, if to talk about actually 
online education in the current moment, the situation was changing during um, all time of the full scale invasion. Um, in February, on February 21st, university uh, had interrupted their works. For example, yeah, my university didn't work right, right, uh, like around in a month. And in this time, most people from universities, they try to save more safe place because universities in Kyiv, so the beginning of the war was like the time when um, the time of the attack uh, of Russian troops to Kyiv. Uh, but around in the, maybe the end of March and the beginning of April, uh, the university made kind of a poll. They stood in contact with staff and students. So there was a question, are you in safe place? And would you like to continue to work and to study? And 70% of people told that, yes, we are ready to continue. So the university went to distance learning. And basically, since this time, university tries to uh, keep this distance learning uh, for safety reasons. Uh, the situation highly changed in the middle of October. For example, on the 10th of October, the buildings of university were um, highly damaged. Uh, it's very um, sad situation. Also, historical buildings in the university, they were under attack. Uh, but uh, what is uh, big, biggest, uh, what is more um, crucial program for education is that uh, the energy system of Ukraine in the current moment is highly damaged. So uh, it's not easy to deliver a normal online lecture to make online conference. Also, people are doing this, we are doing this, but it um, has new challenges because uh, in the current moment, for example, in Kyiv, normally people have like four hours of electricity per day. So uh, generally, you have to, uh, you uh, if you have electricity, you have internet connection and all the, all, all the next time you have nothing. And of course, lecturers and students, they are trying to adapt themselves to the situation. Of course, now it's a little bit, uh, the adaptation is starting to work. People have some, sol some sort of electric generators, etc. but it does not solve completely the problem. And so usually online lectures looks like, looks like this, you are doing an online lecture. And of course, some student can join and another one can just because uh, the electricity can be in one part of Kyiv and in another part of Kyiv. No, no, no electricity, no internet connection, nothing. So uh, we are trying to make a lot of efforts in order, in order to uh, solve this problem, like to uh, make some video lectures, to extend the opportunity for self studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but of course, it is very uneasy, and uh, it is called now a synchronic learning when, when you're trying to find more uh, individual time for every student in the moment when they can actually join you or con contact with you, etc. cetera. Um, about migration, as I told, 70% of, of students are in touch. To give you a general idea, before the war one year ago in Ukraine, Ukraine had 1 million students, more than 1 million students. So we're talking about huge amount of people and around 30% of students are currently abroad and also situation is changing. Maybe it's better to tell not about migration, like this, some sort of mo mo mobility because people uh, go, go abroad and they come back and it happens all the time because well, situations was a little bit better till the beginning of uh, winter semester. So a lot of people, a lot of scholars, students, they just came back home. But uh, now uh, the situation is getting worse and we expect that it will not be heating in Ukraine. So it is also a huge problem in um, a city where you, you, the winter might have like minus 20 degrees. So it's, it's, it's not easy to survive. Of course, people uh, try to find opportunities to spend winter somewhere outside of Ukraine or at least in some places that out of cities. Um, so this is also some kind of sort of situation when there is post like um, big, uh, a lot of big movements. Uh, and this is a, also, I can tell about scholars, so they go abroad, they come back, and they go abroad again. So this is some sort of this 
situation and also about uh, research. Uh, scientists, they do their job actually in Ukraine, and I would like to tell that most of them, they switch their uh, research topics to those that are relevant to current issues, to current situations. So of course, they try to work under the problems that can help to solve situation or help to deal with everything that happens in different fields. Uh, so science exists, of course, despite of everything I told, uh, science exists, students are learning, so it is, um, well, every, everyone try to try to do what he or she can in order to adapt uh, to situation and in order to preserve the system. Thank you, Kalina. Um, you, you already started talking about sort of my, my next question that I, that I uh, was thinking about. Um, and that is, um, you know, the situation of your colleagues. So you talked a bit about the students, but also like, um, I am wondering, um, how do people, how do your colleagues take that decision? Do I leave Ukraine if I can, if I'm female, basically, or do I come back to Ukraine? And what kind of uh, push and pull factors exist for making this decision of leaving Ukraine, going back to Ukraine? Um, maybe some of those are not so obvious to us. So, you know, a harsh winter is quite obvious. But I'm wondering also, you probably know personal stories from your colleagues and, and um, do you know um, what factors were important or are important for your colleagues when they decide what to do? Well, I think the most important for a scholar is actually to stay in profession and to save positions. So uh, most people in Ukraine who have like full-time job, full job who have positions, they try to preserve it. And I know many people who left and they come back just in order to, to, to save their places in the university because it is very important to stay. Uh, also, of course, um, in, in the current moment, we have um, uh, really many kind of solidarity of our colleagues as so this uh, wonderful Ukraine fellowship in the research and another program that helps uh, to scholars like to uh, be engaged into profession. So I'm pretty sure that everybody who will afford to stay in professions, they will come back when the situation will become better because of course the reason to leave was only actually unsafety, unsafety situation. Uh, so I think this is two basic things to, to stay in profession and to save the job as they are the most uh, important factors in the current moment. Mm 